Listen for the ancient word of God found in John chapter 15, verses 9 to, 20, to 17. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my father. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask him in my name. I am giving you these commandments so that you may love one another. So during this season, we are um, studying well, I have been studying. <laughs> I don't know that anybody else has been reading it. But I have been reading um, this book called Courageous Faith by Reverend Dr. Emily C. Heath. She is a UCC pastor from um, the New England states. And um, we've been talking about what it means to have a spiritual resurrection. What would it mean for the church to have a spiritual resurrection? And our scriptures for today um, talk about love. They, um, and they remind us of how we are to be connected by love. When I, um, now I'm going to, there was more to that. A couple of years ago, we received the criticism that we preach too much about love. And... I think that that comes from a misunderstanding of what we mean when we say love. Because the love that we're talking about is not the emotional love that you may have with a partner, um, spouse, or, or even the love of a parent or child. It's the word love here, and, and this, it's the way it was used in the Old Testament also, has much more to do with a loyalty. It has much more to do with you love someone by making them a priority in your life. So loving God is not about um, just, I mean, hopefully there is this this deep um, emotional feeling within you um, for God, but also about making God a priority in your life. And this idea of loving one another is about making others a priority in your life. That love others as you love yourself means you give priority to the well-being of others as much as you give priority to the well-being of yourself. That's the challenge. So... When we had our son, who was our third, um, the baby, they, I thought you'd appreciate it. Everybody calls him the baby, even though he's 24. Um, I decided, what do I know about raising boys? Because I already had two girls. 
And so I went looking for a book to read. <laughs> and my favorite was this one, The Men They Will Become, by Eli Neuberger. And what it said to me was that if I, to raise a man, because that's what I was really raising, not just a boy, um, I, want him, I wanted him to become a productive male um, and, and socially responsible. I needed to create a circle of mentor, male mentors for him. Really, the, sense is, the idea is it takes a village to raise a child. Now, I know that that statement has political overtones. But if we take those and set them aside, if we ignore the political part of that, how it's become politicized, it's also the basis of our baptismal lit liturgy. It's exactly why, and, and it's, that's one of the things that we're hearing in the cottage meetings, is that the baptisms really stand out for people, even if it's not their child. The way we come up here and surround a family and say, we are family, and maybe that's why that came out too, that that, um, that, that is just such a powerful stance. It's just a reminder to us that none of us, no, no, no person, no family, has the sole responsibility of helping a child become a Christian. Just as no one by themselves can effectively, and, if, uh, and, and to be a, a good person within the society, be raised alone. In fact, there's all kinds of, I didn't do that research, but there's all kinds of studies out there about what happens when children have not bonded with others, when children are isolated and, and grow up alone, and it's not good. We need that community. We need that, that bonding with others. Beyond our families, God created us to be social creatures, to rely on one another, to need one another. But the problem is, we all want to be the favorite. You know, we say that all people are the children of God. We are all God's children. But we all want to be the one in the center being held. That's the problem, right? We all want to say, but we're, we're more special than they are. And through the ages, that's exactly what the Christian church has done. And that's kind of where I want, it's, want us to, a little bit of what I want us to own today. Is that, I, that idea that rather than saying, wow, we are loved and so are you, we like to say, we are loved. <laughs> Maybe not, maybe not as much, because there's some things about you. Um, actually, we really, or we really like what you have, so I think we're going to have some of it too. And, and we have this, we learned, as a civilization, as people, we learned early on that we can get things through force and violence, war, oppression, we are better than you, therefore you will, will be beholden unto us. You will be our slave. That's not treating people as if they are equally children of God. Which is the message from Genesis. That we were all made in the image of God. This idea that the, ch that the church has skewed what it means to be Christian, I think has a lot to do with the fact that right now 20% of Americans relate to being or, or identify as what they call nuns, which means they have no spiritual or, re or they have no religious affiliation. They consider themselves to be spiritual, but they're not part of an organized religion because they see organized religion saying one thing and doing something different. And we've done it from the beginning. 
You know, we've said that this is who we are supposed to be. We said that God has called us to love God and one another, and yet that's not what we do. It's not the walk we take. This um, particular piece was by Tara Isabella Burton in November, and she um, told the story of Ava Lee Scott. Ava is a uh, an actress and would-be um, theater producer um, or um, and director, and she was raised both Catholic and Jewish, which is an interesting dynamic, and um, and saw all of the hypocrisy and left it, left it all. So now she, she's what you would call eclectic. She studies the ancient languages. She knows Aramaic, which was the language of Christ, and Hebrew and Arabic. But she also reads tarot cards and cowrie shells and runes. So she looks for... Her, her guidance from a spiritual power, which some may call God, in all different ways. In ways that the church would say, oh, that's heretical. That's, that can't be done. You can't connect to God like that. Well, maybe it's not the way we've always connected to God. It's, it's not orthodox. But why do we have to tell her She's not welcome. When she makes the statement, whatever name you call your higher power, we are all connected. She understands the, the way that we're connected, even if she comes at it from a different standpoint. I think this is where the church is challenged. The church is challenged to decide if we can change. To decide if after 2,000 years of saying we follow Jesus, if we can start living it. If we can really live out our call to hold up the well-being of others. Instead of going to sleep with a, with a good conscience while other people are starving and have no shelter. Who are we? Do we care about those who are pushed out? Who are not welcome to walk in here? Or who do not feel welcome? Who are afraid to walk in our doors? Because they don't know how we're going to react to them. We need to live it in our lives so that they look at us and they say, I'm be, I would be okay if I went with them. I actually met somebody um, at a lecture. I was at the, um, John Dominic Crossan was at the UU church this weekend, and I went to his lectures yesterday, and I met someone, and they said, you're the pastor at Apostles? Well, I know this person, I've met this person and this person and this person that, that worship there. I think I'm going to come to worship at Apostles because I really like those people. And I think you would be a place I could worship. That's what we want. We want people who notice that we live differently. We stand out in the culture because we're not just going along with whatever the culture says. Because that's what I think Jesus did. I think Jesus lived his ministry. Jesus loved others. And he did that by reaching across those boundaries. He went to those people that other people said, oh, they're not clean, they need, they're not welcome here, they're whatever. He went to them and he said, you are welcome. I will bring you into the community. He went to the people and healed them, not just to relieve their suffering, and that certainly is in there, but, but by relieving their suffering, he was able to bring them back into a community. 
They were no longer, they no longer needed to be outside. Because they were healed, they were now welcomed back by whomever deemed that they were unworthy. Now they could be worthy because Jesus had healed them. Jesus was all about crossing those boundaries and making sure that everyone knew that they were a child of God. Last weekend, I went to, it's lecture series time, I went to hear uh, Reverend Nadia Bowles-Weber, who is a Lutheran pastor, um, who spoke. She was in the area. And I love what she said in that she said, our best hope, so, that, so I, I've, I've sort of been beating up the church so far and <laughs> saying how we've, we haven't been living it out. Um, but her hope is in the disciples. Because the good news about the disciples is that they messed it all up. <laughs> there is, they, at every turn, they got it wrong. And he's constantly telling them that. And so her quote my, out of my notes was this. Jesus was so bad at choosing friends that maybe I could have been one of his friends too. He's, Jesus loves everyone. He's got no taste. Jesus makes beautiful things out of the stuff I want to get rid of. Sit with that a minute. That statement is so powerful. Jesus makes beautiful the stuff I want to get rid of. Wow. We want to be a welcoming congregation. I heard that Friday night at the cottage meeting. We want everyone who walks through our doors to feel welcome here. To feel like they can worship God and be part of our community. But I also heard that there's this fear. And fear is what really, it has such a powerful hold on our lives. If we could just let go of our fears. We, being a large congregation, have a fear. And our fear is that... If we go up to somebody that we don't recognize and say good morning and start to engage in a conversation with them, we're going to offend them because they might be a member who hasn't been here in a while. So we're going to do an exercise right now. I'm going to give you about a minute to turn to someone near you I challenge you to pick someone that you don't know. But this could be a lot of fun and it could help you laugh through your anxiety and let go of your fear if you do it with someone you do know. As we're, I gave you the words. I don't believe we've met. That way, if you've seen them before and you forgot, they have an out to say, oh, yeah, we did. You know, we all have those kind of memories. I don't believe we've met. My name is... I'm so glad you came to worship together today. You don't need to ask them if they're a member. You don't need to worry about that. You can let all of that go. Just, I'm so glad you chose to come to worship. All right? So it's right on the screen. <laughs> I'm going to give you a minute. Pick someone near you and introduce yourself. It seems like you really needed to do that. <laughs> Because you had a lot of energy for that. <laughs> Maybe we need to do that more often. <laughs> we don't put a, a passing of the peace in the middle of the service. We keep that at the end. Um, and a lot of that has to do with timing. But, but you had a lot of energy for that. So that was really great to see. It's good to see that the church has energy. And energy to be a community. Because that's what it's about. You know? I've been, I've, I've sort of been... Um, ripping on the church a little bit, and, and, and that's not just this church, that's the church, that's the big church, okay? But as a church, as this church, we have a choice to make, right? We have a choice to decide to just let 
the church drift away into oblivion to just, you know, if, if we just keep coming because we feel obligated, it's something we do on Sunday morning, and, but there's no energy in it and there's no joy that comes out of it if we don't, if we don't feel different leaving here, then that's what's going to happen. But if we decide that the church has passion, that the church wants to make a difference in this world, because each one of us alone makes a very small difference, but when we get together and we join together on a project, we have so much energy and power that we can make such a difference. That's what I'd like to see us do. That's what we're trying to, to get out of, of the cottage meetings and, and the big ideas that you were invited to do. Like, how can we really make a difference? How can we share? How can we make our welcome to the community so much bigger? That people can find out that you can come here and you won't feel like you have to, you have to fit into a certain box. We're getting rid of the boxes getting rid of the labels. If people want a relationship with Christ, then they are welcome here. And I'm going to sh end by sharing this um, quote from Carmelo Alvarez. Carmelo Alvarez is uh, a global ministries partner in Latin America. As we're about to, to have communion, and communion, or koinono <laughs> koinonia, <laughs> I even looked at Tracy because I'm like, Tracy's going to be here. Tracy's a Greek scholar. I'm like, mm, I'm going to mess this. I'm going to mess this pronunciation up. Koinonia includes the sharing of human resources. It's not just about bread and cup. It is, but it's about so much more. It's about sharing our human resources, material goods, and communal fellowship. A commitment of solidarity toward unity as a witness in a broken and divided world. That is a witness our world needs so much right now. That can change the course of history right now. To show that we can be together. We can show a different way of living and being as people. May that be so. Amen.